Welcome to Seasoned. I'm Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. Well, Chef, it's that time of year. It's back to school week for a lot of parents, you and me included, and we have never quite experienced a school year like this one. You know, some kids are going back full time, some are going just a few days a week, and some are going to do the whole thing from home. I mean, the summer just went so fast. I can't believe we're already talking about back to school. Mm -hmm. Later, we'll hear about the work Chef Dan Juicy is doing in New London Public Schools to ensure that the kids are getting delicious lunches made from scratch. And a hand in mom describes the challenges of accessing school-provided meals for her son with severe food allergies. But first, in a school year that's really so unusual and likely filled with a lot more stress, how can we take some shortcuts with lunches? What are some healthy snacks we can have ready to go? Well, Diane Morrissey is a self-taught home cook from Trumbull, Connecticut. She's also a recipe creator and food stylist. Over the last 12 years, she has sent six kids off to school with brown bag lunches. She's here to share some of her advice and favorite lunch tips. Diane, thanks for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Not many human beings can roam the earth and say that they are the mother of six children and live to tell nor, the Nor days. should they. Yes. Yeah, so congratulations. Tell us first a little bit about what lunch means to you and your family as someone who loves food and someone who cooks every day. Well, I mean, lunch is like, it's right. It's sustenance. It's when you have children, you, you're always running around chasing them, concerned that they're eating enough to keep them going. So I always felt that they didn't eat a breakfast and a lot of them gave me a hard time with that. If I at least got a good lunch into them, then I knew that they were going to have enough energy to get through the day. Plum has three kids. I have two kids. One is constantly hungry. He's 14. One is 11. And he has been staging a hunger strike since oh, he was geez. two. He does not yeah. love eating. That's just not his favorite pastime. So, you know, sending them off with lunch is a challenge. What do you do? It's all trial and error. And you learn as you go along, as you guys know. And I, you know, lunch was my children attended a parochial private school. There was no lunch room. So I had to pack six lunches every day because there wasn't a cafeteria that provided lunch. So I had no option. So I had to learn real quick what my kids wanted and what they didn't want. And I learned that by a lot of lunches coming home uneaten. And I used to say to them, at least you, you, you were so dumb. You brought the lunch home, hide it, throw it out. <laughs> so I didn't know that you didn't need it. But if they were bringing the evidence home, I never could figure that one out. I learned real quick, they are grazers. And I think children respond to the grazing idea better than the entire meal being put in front of them. Because I think it overwhelms them. If you give them something that's too big and too bulky, it just overwhelms them. So I used to, when they were small, I used to put out like a large platter of things that they could dip and snack on, like cheese and crackers and cubed up turkey and little the, veggies. The kid version of a crudite. Well, it's so true. Kind of. But you know what, Mary Marisol, that's exactly how I still like to eat. I like to graze. You're not committing to a large meal. And I think parents overpack. I think they pack too much. The fact is the kids only get, by the time they're shuffled in and out, of lunch, they're only given maybe 10, 15 minutes to actually eat. And then you got to factor in all the, the socializing and whatnot. So if they're given something that's too big, I think a big sandwich automatically overwhelms kids and they just put that aside. So little things, things that they could pick on and eat easily was always my mantra and still sort of is even as they're, you know, teenagers. You know, it's interesting you should say that because I think it's important that when you're packing lunch for kids, to be thoughtful about it. I found myself in the early years packing a lunch for my daughters. I'm 250 pounds. My daughters are like it was yeah, for well, you. They're tiny people, and I'm packing lunch more for me. Like the food is, I was thinking more about myself That's right. with the food as opposed to them. Yeah. And I think a lot of adults do that. A lot of parents do that. So what are some real menu items that you've given them? Are you giving them leftovers? Is it, you know, the macaroni you made from the night before? So yeah, I mean, you know, some dippy things. I mean, and that's still how my kids, teenagers and young adults still like to eat. Um, I'd put chicken, you know, chicken nuggets or chicken fingers or even fish sticks in a thermos and then give a little dipping sauce on the side, you know, pretzel nuggets, anything on a kebab, they really responded to. I'd buy those little wooden skewers, right? You can get 5,000 skewers for like $3. So I always had 5, those little- 5,000 for $3. That is oh, I'm not deal. kidding you, Marisol. 
Come on, Plum. You hey, know what I'm, I'm right talking there with about. You. I would put little a little piece of cheese and two grapes on sticks, and I'd put it in little in That's there. It. Anything on a stick, they absolutely love. They love it. And then if you have it on a stick and you provide a little dipping sauce, forget about it. That really does. That they like that. I hate to be the Debbie Downer. Yep. I have the kid that would take that stick and Stab then somebody with it. You know, create a sword fight in the cafeteria, and then the principal is calling me saying, "Miss Castro, please come pick up your child." He started well, he's creative. A war. I have that kid too. Actually, I have a few of those kids too. <laughs> <laughs> they 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 kind of grow out of that stage. They're, rest assured, Mary Saul. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know. You haven't met Gavin. He's, uh... <laughs> Diane, you said something I thought was interesting. You talked about grazing. You get that, right? Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more when it comes to that. I almost got to where I was doing almost like a bento box style lunch for my daughters. Like, I like that. Where it was like there was a section of raw vegetables, green beans, little mozzarella balls, cherry tomatoes, and just things like that kind of in little portions and little sections. And I found they would actually eat more stuff like that. So those bento boxes, they weren't available when my kids were younger. But if they were, I would have been all over them because that's exactly the type of way that I used to pack and still do. I think it's brilliant and I wish it were around when I was packing lunches. It wasn't. I take that in a, in a kind of a roundabout way, Marisol. Well, she just called me brilliant. That's how I take that. I don't know that I called you brilliant. Is that how you heard that? <laughs> Definitely not go that far. That's funny that that was your perception <laughs> well, of what listen, I just said, I, but okay. I've been married a long time. Any compliments I get, I'll take them. I can get them. It's fine. I'm going to ask the two of you who are far more experienced in the kitchen than I am. You mentioned chicken nuggets. I'm also thinking of like pizza bagels or things that I know my kid likes, has had for dinner the night before. What is the best way to keep it delicious from the time it leaves my house at, you know, 745 to the time he eats lunch at 1130? Like, I've tried aluminum foil. I've tried a Tupperware. Sometimes I get the, it's soggy. It lost its crunch. And I'm like, dude, if you're hungry, you're going to eat it. So any tips for keeping food warm in its original state. I got by a lot of years using thermoses and I would have put lots of different things, not just soup in them. When I used to put like something like chicken nuggets, I put French toast sticks, you know, I put pretzel nuggets. I'd fold a paper towel up and put it at the bottom of the thermos. And that barrier in between the, like the heat source from the bottom of the thermos and the food I thought kept it a bit crunchy and you're always going to lose the crunch factor. But I always thought that that did the trick for me. I don't know about how Chef Plum feels. So I would actually pour boiling water into the thermos, let it sit with that water in there, then just take a quick paper towel, wipe it out, and then put your warm stuff in there so it's already warm. It already has that heat in there so that things stay warm most of the day. That's brilliant. That's twice my I'm actually going to say that's actually brilliant. Three times. I like that. Three times. It is. I actually, Chef Plum, I do that with my coffee cup in the morning. So it's not that brilliant because I currently do that. <laughs> However, I, I did not ever do that with my thermos, and now I'm kind of kicking myself. I should have. I get, I get half a brilliant for that. How about half that? Your, that's a half a brilliant. I get a half a brilliant. And then when it comes to lunches too, I found that with my daughters, I would include them in making the lunch mm. for things that they'd want to put in there and how they would like it. You know, And now with my daughters going into eighth grade, they actually get up in the morning and make their lunches on their own. And they're really, really thoughtful in how they do it. Again, it kind of goes back to that, just thinking about the food that you're putting in there. You know, If you're going to put you know, apples for your kid in your lunch, well, don't put a whole apple in there. That's not fun to eat, but cut it up in pieces. Um, or if you are going to put apple slices in there, if they turn brown from oxidation throughout the day, just take a little bit of acidulated water, which is just a little lemon juice and water, and just dip them in there for a second. Okay, I did that once. I put a lemon wedge in with the apple because no, I thought it was being really cool. No, that really makes cool. apple lemons. <laughs> no, no kid wants to open up and sit oh boy, and see a lemon wedge in their apples. Mm -mm. Oh, no. Gavin just ate the lemon oh. wedge <laughs> and left the apples. But can we have a moment to discuss sandwiches? Because a good old-fashioned sandwich can go a long way. But you up your sandwich game how? Actually, I learned this over the years. And I, I'll stand by what I said about sandwiches in general. The size of them overwhelm kids. And they don't eat them. So I used to correct that by little slider rolls. So I made sandwiches but I put them on tiny slider rolls. And number one, how adorable is that? And number two, they're not overwhelming. They're not, so a child is more apt to pick up a sandwich, which is on a slider roll as opposed to a big bulky roll. Fantastic idea. Keeping it small like that. But what about a good old fashioned piece of like 
multi-grain sliced bread. Is that just too plebeian for everybody? My kids never really liked a whole lot of seeded breads or anything like that, but you're always going to get the complaint of it being soggy. If I was going to do another version of a sandwich, it would be on a wrap because tortillas are a lot more forgiving and they don't get soggy like a piece of bread does. So back when I was doing high-end catering, we did something for lunches we'd call high rollers, where we would take wraps and we'd roll them up and then we'd toothpick, you know, take the wrap, it's long, and we'd put, you know, five or six toothpicks in it and then slice them. So then it looks like these little pinwheels of whatever's in the wrap. And then I would actually take that and pack that into the lunch as well. So one, it looks pretty cool. Two, it's small and easy to eat. And three, they can pick whatever they want to put in that wrap and it would stay in there from that toothpick. So I think wraps are a great way to go. Absolutely. I'm big on leftovers. It works with one kid, doesn't work with the other. So if I made arroz con habichuela, rice and beans with chuletas, a pork chop the night before, it's going in the thermos, like all in one thing like that. Like here's your paella, have it, go. Try chopping that pork chop up into smaller pieces. No, and, I do. And mix I do. It all together. I'm, no, I'm not Nothing. an animal. I chop it up. I put it all in there. It's not like I send him to school with the cutlery, like with you know, with your, with your fancy <laughs> that's knives. But that's I, hysterical. I, I, Diane, you have a very interesting backstory. You yeah. actually worked at Whole Foods in the prepared food section. What was that like, and how did it prepare you to make these extraordinary meals that you make? Well, yeah. I mean, I did. I worked for Whole Foods for about 15 years, and I started off running their prepared foods departments in Connecticut and New York City stores. And then I got into store leadership and, you know, got away from the food a little bit. Basically, when you're running Whole Foods prepared foods departments, you are running little restaurants, especially in the New York City stores. You know, you're feeding 25,000 people a day at, at any time. So it's preparing food for a lot of different people at a lot of different tastes and giving options. And um, it's just bulk food being done constantly. You know, and, you know, we were talking about things that, you know, slam dunks or home runs that you put in the lunchbox that the kids, you know, you're going to eat. One thing that always worked really well for me was muffins of any type, whether savory or sweet. And like mini muffins was a big thing. Again, going to the theme where a regular cupcake size was a bit big for them. When, When I made mini muffins for the kids, oh, they loved them. And if I can get two zucchini muffins or two banana muffins into a kid during a lunch period, I was really happy with that. I like that because that stretches a long way and you could do sweet or you could do savory. I am big on making banana bread. I'll make, a, I'll make some banana breads at the beginning of the week. They can graze. They can either have it as their dessert or have it as their snack. Talk to me about dips, though. I tried to do hummus with carrots. Yeah. Again, worked for one kid, didn't work for the other. How about ranch? I mean, ranch, I don't, I've never met a child that, that will turn down ranch dipping sauce. Ranch white bean dip that you can make really simply with cannellini beans, hummus, the, those always work for my kids. I'd make pesto with, you know, with no nuts in it. So if there were any allergies in the class, that was always a big hit, especially when I'd put tortellini in the thermos, they could dip it with a skewer into the pesto. All right, Diane, I'm putting you back on the hot seat. Give me some sample menus. Monday, you're sending your kid off to oh, school. Oh gosh. I mean, you know, it depends how old they are. You know, I used to do little cutout sandwiches you know, you get a say make a sandwich, then you get a fun little cookie cutter and punch out a shape. The kids used to love that. But right now, I mean, uh, I'll make chicken cutlets or you listen, if you want to buy chicken cutlets, buy chicken cutlets, the breaded chicken cutlets, cut them up into strips, put them in a thermos and have a little side of marinara. That's a home run for all of my kids every day. Little mac and cheese muffins, right? You get a little, you know, cupcake tin and you make mac and cheese, but portion them off into cupcake size and bake them off and you have individual size mac and cheese muffins little frittatas chef plum i bet you do that as well absolutely those are great little mini frittatas and you could do those on the weekend in bulk and you could put anything in in a frittata you can just keep it veggie or put ham or chicken in there to get the extra protein what about an english muffin pizza i never really packed those for the kids i would make those like i have remote learners now at home right they're they're going to class in, in front of the computers I'll make those for them while they're home, but I don't know that those travel well enough, to be honest. And again, you want to be practical. You don't want to kid yourself that everything you pack is going to be eaten by your child. Absolutely. So, Diane, you brought up hybrid learning, and I think it's a really great thing to to talk about because we're all going to be dealing with that now. My kids go to school two days a week, I think, is a situation. Then they're off one day, then they go back a day, and then they have to go around, go to some other state, and then come back and do it again. I don't know what the situation (laughs) is, Uh, but... 
I have to work, my wife has to work, so we're trying to think about things we can keep in the house that are easy for them to kind of grab and have lunch during the day. And for me, having a big salad around, kind of keeping cut up fruit around would be a good idea. I love your chicken cutlets, keeping those things around, uh, boiled eggs, that sort of thing. What do you think would be a good, some good tips on hybrid learning food to keep around the house so you can keep uh, that meeting you have to do on time still while the kids have lunch? I think, you know, I I was always a big fan and still am, you know, now that I have a lot of teenagers, a lot of large, my boys, right? They're all lifting. They all want protein. They're constantly eating. So pasta salads were always a huge go-to for me. I can always have, you know, listen, right now they're at the age where they'll look in the fridge, they'll open it up. It can be filled with food and they'll still say there's nothing to eat. So sometimes you kind of got to knock them over the head with what you have in the fridge to let them know, yes, there is, take another look. So pasta salads were always a go-to for me. First of all, they're, they're cost effective. You could feed a lot of people with them. The more things you add into the salad, the more sustenance it has. And it's really easy to add, you know, bacon or chicken or tuna to a pasta salad to make it beefier and bulkier for them. So those were always a go-to for me in their thermos, whether it be, you know, cold uh, or home for remote learning. I think pasta salads are great. And also, you know, with the type of, if you think about like a bowl, like a a veggie grain bowl type of way that my girls love to eat now. And you go to a store, you you pick your, your grain, your protein, you pick your salad dressing, you pick your veggies, and you build a, a really fabulous grain bowl. Now, if you have all of those, it's not a big deal to make a batch of farro or a batch of wheat berries or quinoa, have them in the fridge. And then have a rotisserie chicken that's cut up or, you know, roast off some veg so that the kids can sort of throw it together and make themselves a really simple, healthy grain bowl. Yeah, I think those things are fantastic. Anything you could put together, kind of let them make their own choices based on what you've already got prepared in the fridge is always a win. I think if the kids are making their own choices and they feel like it's something they put together, they're definitely going to eat it more likely than if I were to put it together for them. Absolutely, right. Hey, what about some of those mid-afternoon pick-me-ups when it's, you know, three o'clock, four o'clock, you need to get that snack bound before dinner? What's something you think would be a great pick-me-up for adults or kids? Beside a glass of Chardonnay? Well, at least wait till five. Would that be considered a pick-me-up? <laughs> I think so, but I don't know if my kid. well, yeah. <laughs> Google Energy Bites, and there are so many great recipes for these little, beautiful, magical balls of energy that you make that kids actually love. So I always have a batch of energy bites, or I try to for the kids. That's a you know great thing. You know what I'm talking about, right? Peanut butter and oats and yeah, for sure. nuts or seeds and chocolate chips. So easy to put together, but really good boost of energy, like yogurt covered pretzels, that type of thing. Mini muffins. I'm a big baker, Chef Plum. So I always have some type of muffin in the house, you know, like an oatmeal berry square type of thing. So there's always something that the kids could grab that isn't going to ruin their appetite, but will give them a little bit of energy, you know, during the day. Diane Morrissey is a mother of six and a professional lunch maker. You can follow her recipes and food tips on her very popular Instagram feed. She's got more than 150,000 followers. It's at Diane Morrissey. Diane, M-O-R-R-I-S-E-Y. Coming up, Chef Dan Giusti talks about his work with school districts to make school food healthier. I'm Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. This is Seasoned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Seasoned. I'm Chef Plum. When it comes to preparing and cooking lunch in schools, it helps to think outside the box like our next guest. Dan Juicy spent the early part of his career as the head chef of Noma in Copenhagen. It's one of the best restaurants in the entire world. But in 2016, Dan left Denmark to come to New London, Connecticut to launch his company, Brigade. Brigade puts professional chefs in school lunchrooms with the goal of improving the menu and teaching the food service teams how to turn $3.51 into wholesome, delicious lunches made from scratch. Currently, Brigade works with school districts in New London, New York City, and Richmond, Virginia. Dan told me about his inspiration for Brigade and how it's been received in these school systems. You know, I got into cooking and... um as you do when you, you're you young and you go to culinary school, you you go and you work in restaurants. And you don't really consider many other career paths. It took me until I was about 30 to realize that I didn't get into cooking to work necessarily in, in fine dining. I have nothing against it. It's just I don't think it was really what I was cut out for. I wanted to do something where I could feed more people. I wanted to cook for people maybe who didn't have access to great food. 
and that's what spurred me to start Brigade. You know, the whole initial intention of Brigade was to get professional chefs to really consider institutional food as a career because it's just it's usually looked down upon in the culinary world as something that you wouldn't do. Basically, in a nutshell, what we do is, you know, we work with school districts. Uh, we hire professional chefs who are you know, genuinely motivated to do this work. It's not about is it a perk, sure, of having, you know, weekends off and holidays off, but that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for people who genuinely do want to get into this to, to help feed kids and improve the quality of the food, and that's what we do. We find those people, we train them on kind of the nuances of working within schools, working within the nutritional guidelines set by the USDA, within the budgetary guidelines set by the USDA, and also just great people who can go into a school, they can assert themselves as a professional, but they can work with the staff and, and make them feel good you know, about what's going on and not talk down to them in the sense that you know, we're not there to tell them what they're doing is bad. Because in most cases, they're doing a great job. It's just that they haven't been set up for success. And together, we, we find ways to make the food better. But more importantly, we, we find ways to make the food really desirable for the kids. And that's the real challenge. Do you find any kind of pushback from the staff that's there? You know, the people who have been there for years working and here comes now they're going to bring this professional chef in here that, you know, they're, they're kind of like, no, that's not how we do this. Or no, we can't do it this way. Is there any pushback? Yeah, hundred percent. I would say it definitely comes down to how we are introduced into the program. So, you know, whoever's in charge, if they bring us in, they properly introduce us, who we are, why we're there. Usually that helps, but there's no question when we go into one of these in an individual school, you know, you might have, let's say you have eight people, you have two people there who are like so into this. There was a time when they were working in the school kit, that same school kitchen where they were cooking from scratch. So they're kind of looking forward to it. Uh, you have two people on the other end of the spectrum who are just like not for it. In the end of the day, it's like, there's no way around it. It's just going to be more work. They're being held more accountable for what they're doing. So they're not super happy. And then in the middle, you have four people that the day goes well and there's extra work put into the food, but if the kids are really happy with it. They're thrilled. But if there's extra work put into the food and it's just a meal that the kids aren't happy with, they're definitely going to question why all this extra work is being put into it. So if it's a successful day and we're getting better and better at that as time goes on, knowing what meals will be successful with kids. Then, then generally most of the staff is on board. Probably the thing I'm most proud of with our team is that they really know how to work well with people. But there's no question there's pushback because at the end of the day, it is more work. You know, in some of the kitchens that we've gone into, you are transitioning from a food service operation that's primarily taking food, um, you know, out of packages and then reheating it and then putting it up to be served versus dishes that require cutting and different cooking techniques and assembly and more, you know, all these things create more cleaning. That's a big part of it. And of course, the satisfaction of the staff is, is at the top of our list as well. You know, I talked about the kids being happy, but we want the staff to be happy too. So it's definitely a huge focus from day one. I wanted to know about the economics of school lunches. The National School Lunch Program is a federally assisted meal program operating under the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The USDA reimburses school systems $3.51 for each lunch. So a lot of folks, they see that number and they say, oh, it's not a lot of money, but it's actually not that bad at all if that was just for food, but that's for everything. So it's for food, that's for labor, maintenance, really anything that you would need to produce the meal. In most cases, in the majority of cases, school food service program is self-sufficient with that reimbursement dollar. So most schools don't give money to the food service program. You know, the school district has a general budget. They usually don't chip in to help the food service program. Uh, when it all comes down to you have about a dollar twenty-five, dollar thirty-five, depending on the meal, for food. And you have to offer five components. So you have to offer a protein, a whole grain, uh, a vegetable, fruit, and the milk. So you have to take three of those things. You can take all five as a kid. Um, if you take a milk, a milk in most places where we work costs in the vicinity of a quarter. You're down to close to a dollar to put together the actual meal. So this is really where the challenge comes in. So you have a dollar for the meal. Again, you're following nutritional guidelines. So it becomes very complicated. Are you allowed to raise that price if you needed to? Even if you could raise it mm -mm. 25 cents, 30 cents? That's a great question because that to me is like the main difference between what we do and what you would do, say, in a restaurant or really any retail environment. It's just that is 
that's the price. I mean, technically you could, you know, if the school district said, Hey, we want to, we want to increase the budget here. We're going to give you an extra, maybe five cents, but that's like, I've never seen that anywhere for us. If we use an extra four cents and we go to compostable forks and knives, that's an extra few cents that will then come away from somewhere else. When we only have a dollar or so for food, when you're taking away a few cents from one place, what is that from? You're already pushing it in terms of what you can afford. So it's really just a matter of priorities. It's prioritizing food quality versus using these sustainable wares versus if you want to prioritize using local and seasonal foods. I mean, it's really just a lot of priorities. And we work with a variety of school districts and each school district has a slightly different priority. And, you know, we're there to help them and support them in that. It's crazy when you think about that, because if you're going to take away that four cents, it's probably going to come off the food cost. It's going to come off of, you know, somebody getting paid. It's got to come from somewhere. When you only have right. three dollars and 41 cents, you know, essentially a dollar 25 to spend on your meal. I mean, every single penny counts. And it, it really does. It's a, shame. It, it's a work thing. Like when we first started in New London, one of our first things that we did was they were using styrofoam trays. You know, people like, oh, my God, it's you know, it's 2020 and people are using styrofoam. It's like, well, styrofoam literally costs like a fraction of a penny. And that's why people use it. We went to New London and all the schools had, they all had dishwashers, like the actual machines. So we said, well, why don't we use plates? So we got these like melanine plates that are like, it's basically like hardened plastic. They look nice and they're, they're like unbreakable. and They're not cheap. So we started using those. Two things happened. One, because we were using plates, you have to have someone wash the plates. That costs money. So now all of a sudden you ha- you're putting your very limited resources in terms of labor towards washing plates. So then that comes away from what you can do in terms of preparation. So that's a choice. We realize that that happened. And then you start losing plates. So whether there's little kids who are throwing away plates by accident or high school kids who are intentionally throwing away plates just because they think it's funny. And then now all of a sudden you have to pay someone to monitor the trash cans to see if kids are throwing plates away. So then it just becomes this thing that gets out of hand where you're spending all this money just to use plates. And like, sure, can you get systems in place to over time to make sure that this stuff's not happening and it's not going to cost you that much extra? Yeah, but it takes time. And, you know, again, along with the money aspect of this, it's very unlikely that you're going to get support from the school district in terms of labor. Like, it's not like they're going to supply you with people that work in, in other parts of the school to help you execute different programs. School budgets in general, not just in the cafeteria, but in general are super tight. And, you know, especially now. And exactly, especially now it's priorities. I think if I asked 10 families, if they had to choose between better food in the cafeteria or like the newest iPads for their kids, they probably would choose the newest iPads. It basically comes down to decisions like that. And I get that. And I think that's a really important lesson that you need to understand. And that's something that we didn't, we thought we were like these amazing people coming into schools and making the food better. It's just like, well, you're just one component of many components. And if you're a principal or a superintendent, you're dealing with a lot of stuff in a school district. And as someone who's going into school to try to make those changes, you have to realize that, that if you cause any disruption in any other way, you're kind of negating any positive impact that you're making with the food. So I asked Dan, what are you making with the dollar and change you're left with for food? And how do you minimize waste? Parents pay attention because Dan is going to drop the simplest tip about getting little kids to eat more fruit. One meal that we put on right in the beginning that was successful and we continue to serve it, we transitioned straight away from chicken nuggets and chicken patties, which is tough because obviously kids love chicken nuggets and chicken patties, but we wanted to put chicken on the menu. So we transitioned to bone-in skin on chicken thighs, which they're very cost-effective. They can cost you like 55 to 60 cents a piece. But delicious. Um, They're delicious and they're great for high volume cooking in the sense that you know, you can cook them to temperature, you can hold them, and they actually, they stay moist, they stay delicious, they don't dry out. So we, we roast chicken thighs, barbecue chicken, so we, we glaze them with barbecue sauce we make, make ourselves, put them back in the oven, get it nice and caramelized. We serve it with cornbread that we make ourselves. Cornbread is another great example of, you know, you have to use the, any grain you serve has to be uh, 50% more whole grain. Cornmeal actually qualifies as a whole grain. So 
in the case of like pizza dough or pasta, you have to use whole whole wheat, which you know can throw some kids off. But because cornmeal qualifies as a whole grain, you can make cornbread for the most part like you would make cornbread for anyone. So we can make warm cornbread. We have barbecue chicken, and then we do these like honey roasted carrots. So it's basically carrots that have been roasted whole. We cut them down into pieces, and then we glaze them with honey. And it's just a very successful meal. And you know, you can make it for a dollar twenty-five, dollar <laughs> thirty. So that works out. Pasta dishes are very successful for us. So we do pasta with bolognese. We do pasta with chicken and Alfredo sauce. These are dishes that you know you have kids who a lot of kids who don't want to venture into eating things like carrots. Um, you know, maybe they're used to eating peanut butter and jelly all the time, and to eat a hot meal is a bit of a stretch. But we find with pasta, it seems like everyone likes a dish of pasta. So making these sauces ourselves, we really focus on super, super basic things. Cooking pasta correctly, batch cooking. Instead of, you know, a lot of cafeterias you see, you know, you might be feeding, like in the high school in New London, they might be feeding a thousand kids over three lunch periods in the course of back to back to back, you know, in the course of like an hour and 15, hour and 20 minutes. And you could easily probably just cook it, you know, cook everything and then just serve it. But no, you cook it in batches and you try to make it as fresh as you can. So things like pasta can either be kind of gross where everything's just cooked at once and just mush, or you're cooking it fresh, each lunch wave, fresh sauce, fresh pasta, really tasty, you put it out there, serving it with like a warm garlic bread. We have rolls that we have made and then serve it with some kind of vegetable. I started off the conversation saying how when, you know, the way it works is you have to offer five components and kids have to take three and when they have to take three, one of those components either has to be a fruit or vegetable. And usually what it ends up being is like a whole piece of fruit. Um, so the, the way you usually see a lunch line go in this country is a kid goes to the lunch line, they take a chicken patty sandwich. The chicken patty is the protein. The bun is the whole grain. Then they have to take a vegetable or fruit at least. There's usually no legitimate vegetable preparation or anything that the kid actually wants. So they continue to go through the line right before they check out of the line. There's like, you know, a scrappy looking metal tray, C tray with literally the worst apples you've ever seen on it. But then the kid has to take that. So they have a, they have a compliant meal and then they go through the line and they just throw the apple away. They don't even eat it. I couldn't tell you how many kids I've met who say they don't like apples, which I think it's so strange from day one, we cut all the fruit. Um, we'll serve whole fruit sometimes when we think it makes sense. For example, like bananas, we see kids enjoy eating whole bananas, but we cut all the fruit. So whether it's melon or pineapple, um, we cut it and kids just go crazy and they just consume tons of fruit and they love it. And it's just a sim, you know, is it more work? Yes. It's not like it just happens magically, but it really pays off. So that's just, you know, that's not a whole preparation, obviously, but the addition of just cutting fruit is such a big thing and, and kids really love it and they expect it and they want it. And to think that the alternative before was that fruit was just kind of this thing that they would just throw away. It's kind of crazy. That was Chef Dan Juicy, founder and CEO of Brigade. Dan shared that during the initial school closings during the pandemic back in March, the food service teams in New London delivered grab and go lunches to students by school bus. If you want to learn more about Dan and the work he does in Connecticut, New York, and Virginia, visit chefsbrigade.com. Brigade is B-R-I-G-A-I-D. After the break, we'll hear from a mom and parent advocate from Hamden about her experience with the New Haven Public Schools lunch program. The question went out to the district, like, what are you doing for those children with life-threatening allergies, like for my son? I'm Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. You're listening to Seasoned. We'll be right back. This is Seasoned. I'm Marisol Castro. 92% of public schools in Connecticut take part in the National School Lunch Program you heard about in the last segment. There are several programs under that umbrella providing students with everything from breakfast to meals during the summer. And for many families, those meals are a lifeline. But what about families who are managing food allergies? Najija Ife Waters has two sons in the New Haven and Hamden school districts. She says she struggles to get food for one of her sons who has multiple food allergies. And this has been going on long before the pandemic began. For me, it's been very hard because my son has life-threatening allergies. So I've 
pretty much have been like on a long, long battle with the district in getting foods for children that may have life-threatening allergies, like trying to get that right how to make that connection, how to keep them safe, what does the lunchroom look like for them. So that has been my battle for I think over seven years now. If you don't mind my asking, what is your son's allergy? Eggs, fish, peanuts, tree nuts, berries, dairies, indoor outdoor moles, and animal dander, especially dog dander. Wow, that's a lot. And yes. Yes. I asked Najija Ife how she's been dealing with these challenges during the pandemic where school systems are doing grab and go lunches. That was rough. That was really rough. Unfortunately, my sons didn't really um, get a chance to take advantage of that as much as it could have helped. But unfortunately, the question went out to the district like, what are you doing for those children with life-threatening allergies? Like for my son, I know that my son food is sort of like pre-packaged. So it was like, well, how do we get those foods for him with his allergies or any other child out there that has allergies? It was told to me, it was a good question, but it was a question that never received an answer. I do know that there was one, you know, like the very first time when the food package went out, um, I had a relative who was pretty much going around for all the relatives and different ones in the neighborhood that didn't really want to go out when the COVID first. And when she brought the food back, because they were giving the breakfast and lunch at the same time, Mm -hmm. I'm in like both districts, like Hamden and New Haven. Because my one son is in Hamden, the other son is inter-district. So Hamden was more of, here's food. You know, you can have access to the food. Where New Haven, um, I had parents reporting back to me that, unfortunately, you had to prove that you were in the New Haven school. What did you do with your son and the allergies? Because you you said, you know, you, you inquired and you were told we're working on it. At the beginning, was very rough because of his allergies. A lot of the food that he could eat, it was, you can barely um, see them on the shelves. And one of the good things I loved about the community, um, some of the parents who know me and know my son, when they went to the stores, they were asked me, like, what are the things that he can eat? So if they saw those items when they went out, they will grab those items and then they will bring them to me. So I was grateful for that. So you essentially, when COVID hit and you are in this predicament that your child's life literally depends on what he consumes. And it sounds like you were depending on the community around you to help. Pretty much. Like I said, I reached out to the schools, um, to the superintendent, to the director of student service. And I said, hey, what happens to him? Like, is there some way that you guys are providing meals for the students um, that has allergies. It's like, I didn't understand that whole breakdown. Like, cause my thing was if the food was already coming in then there should have been food that was already labeled for him. So Understood. where was that food and how can we access that particular food? No one had an answer for us. So we pretty much went without accessing food from the district. Najija Ife says she's now used to preparing food for her son, knowing that she can't count on the school systems to provide food that is safe for a child with multiple food allergies. I've been doing that for years. I've been sending food for my son regardless. (laughs) From the time he entered school, I've been doing this. But it would be nice because when you think about your budget, I'm buying for the house as well as I'm buying for him, you know, for school. So it's like, it's extra. Like I'm like, it's like a double up, Yeah, you know? So it's like, when do I get a break? It would be nice to be able to tap into something that will provide that additional help, you know, because buying food for someone who is very limited is very expensive. What are you hoping will happen? I don't expect anything other than what I'm doing. I don't have no expectations. If I get surprised, you know, with them saying, hey, we finally figured it out for him, you know, then it would be like, whew. But 
I know that if I fix my child his food, I don't have to worry about getting that phone call saying, meet us at Yale. <laughs> that have always been my fear. And that's why I think I fight so hard for it because there has been a couple of times that that could have been my son's life. We spoke with New Haven Mayor Justin Elliker, responding to Najija Ife Waters' comments that she could not get food that was safe for her son to eat. Uh, I'm quite surprised to hear that. Any child with allergy issues was provided an appropriate meal, and that continues to be the case. And also any family that was asked, uh, that is, has asked for food was never turned away. If families asked for 10 meals, they were given 10 meals without any requirement that the family provide specific details about their child. Uh, I'm unclear why Ms. Waters had the issues she described, um, and I checked with our food service office, and, and they uh, had no record of her requesting the allergies, but if she needs that support, like many other kids that have had specific allergy issues, uh, she will get that kind of support. I think it's also important to underscore that our school system gave out, um, from March to August, uh, over 750,000 meals. And we've had many distribution events all over the city. We, of course, want to make sure that every single child has access to food, regardless of income, citizen status, allergies, or any other needs. And the food service office at New Haven Public Schools is working very, very hard, and I think quite successfully, to do just that. I can't imagine the task of, um, first of all, the very task of providing school lunches to students, period, full stop. Then you factor in a pandemic and you have to pivot and now do the grab and go situation. So I have to think that there was a lot of things that got lost in the shuffle. What do you attribute, though, her her inability to get that lunch? Because when we spoke to her, she said, you know, she did make phone calls and she was told, thank you for bringing this to our attention. We're going to work on it. You know, and this was a very frustrated parent. So what do you attribute, if you could, you know, knowing that it's such a big school system and there are so many moving parts, but what do you think, what do you attribute that to? It's hard to know exactly who she spoke with. Um, I spoke with our director of uh, food services today to get more information on the history here. The food services staff was at every school that was providing food and we did a lot of work to make sure that families knew about this. And any time uh, any family uh, spoke to the food service staff on site at these food distribution sites, they would relay information of special needs to uh, the central office, and that food would be distributed to uh, families that was specific to their allergy needs. And so uh, very shortly afterwards, uh, there would be allergy-specific meals to those sites that needed them. So it's hard to know exactly what happened without more information. Our food service director, I spoke with her about calling Ms. Waters to address a specific issue because we wanna make sure that every child in New Haven, regardless of what uh, special needs they may have, has access to food, especially during a pandemic. Thank you for for clarifying that because I was going to ask, if not for Ms. Waters, but for perhaps other families who have similar issues, what would be the best way for them to get in contact with your office or with the district um, so that this doesn't become a, a bigger problem down the road? Sure, they can do so in two ways. One is to contact their schools, and now it's um, a little bit easier because our online system is much more robust and up and rolling. Today's first day of school or they can call uh, the food service office and the phone number is 475-220-1610, 475-220-1610 and get their needs addressed. That's New Haven Mayor Justin Elliker. Now let's zoom out a bit to the state of Connecticut. How is the state thinking about how we're feeding students in need right now and since the pandemic began? John Frasinelli is the Bureau Chief of Health, Nutrition, Family Services and Adult Education at the Connecticut State Department of Education. He told us how schools had to change the way they provided meals to students. The way that we were able to authorize schools to shift operations, which is essentially what they did, they shifted operations from a in-person, prepare the meals, serve them in the cafeteria, to uh, providing those meals to go once schools closed. And so we had applied for a number of waivers uh, and flexibilities that were open to us in Connecticut in order to do that. So it shifted things like uh, serving meals. You didn't have to consume the meal in person anymore, right? You could have those meals to go. Um, and then later on, a flexibility opened up that you didn't need to bring your children to the school anymore. Parents and guardians could come and pick up meals for the children. 
things like handing out uh, a week's worth of meals on Monday. So folks didn't have to come out every day to get meals. So those are some of the waivers that we either applied for and got permission from or that were later issued by the federal government as a national waiver. So what happens in this situation is that we sort of shifted to what we usually refer to as a summer food service model. So um, as you mentioned, you saw those meals that uh, those signs that said that meals were available for free. And that's what happens in a disaster. So there's no longer any eligibility determination necessarily. It's like any child 18 years of age or, or under uh, could access a meal at no cost to them at, at any of the sites that were shifted from the school lunch program model to the summer model. Um, and so that does a couple of things. It takes the burden off of all families because as you know, folks were folks were losing their jobs, they were losing wages, people were falling into poverty very quickly. Um, and so this gave them an immediate uh, opportunity to get meals for their kids, you know, as they lost, you know, their economic advantage. So, so that was really wonderful. Uh, and, and so families really took advantage of that. We were doing, we, when I say we, I mean the, the 130 school districts at over 500 sites in Connecticut were providing meals on a daily basis to families. And that's about 110, 115,000 meals a day. And so at one point, one story is that Hartford on one day, it was the Thursday before Easter weekend, actually provided 75,000 meals in one day. John says the state is working with school districts now to make sure students who are attending school will be able to get their lunches and eat them safely. First and foremost, we want to make sure that students have access to meals. You can't have a kid, you know, get on the bus at six o'clock in the morning and not have any breakfast and keep them all day and send them home in the afternoon. You know, school breakfast has really pays dividends to, to kids' academic ability to attend in school. It has impacts on their behavior. It has impacts, positive impacts on their ability to do math problems and English problems and all kinds of things. And so there are a number of ways in which they can do that. They can, uh, while maintaining social distancing and you know while maintaining all of those mitigating strategies like mask wearing they can go to the cafeteria spaced out you know get their meal um, schools are working to you know only use part of their cafeteria so that kids can be spaced out in the cafeteria take their masks off to eat be six feet or so from their peers and continue to eat we're also talking about and making sure that they think about using outdoor spaces uh, september and october the, the weather's nice enough where you know, kids can go outside and eat. Again, set up tables outside and eat. There are some models that schools are looking at where they're going to uh, keep the kids, you know, in the classroom until, you know, like 11 o'clock in the morning, and then they're planning on giving them a meal to take home. They're going to have their meal at home, and then they're supposed to re-engage in the afternoon for sort of remote learning. Some folks are doing, again, taking sort of a mask break, uh, spacing the kids out and having that 20-minute lunch period during the day, which is fantastic. Folks are also either providing meals or serving meals during lunchtime in the school day. And then on dis dismissal, they're handing them a breakfast for the next day. So that's fantastic. So the kids have breakfast and fuel for the next day. How will you measure success? I would measure success to, at how closely we can mimic sort of a normal school year in the number of meals that are provided to kids, right? So here's, here's the gold standard. Here's what we did in school year you know, 2019. How close can we get to that? I think that's an indication of success. I mean, compounded by the fact that we know there are a lot of a lot more families who are going to be eligible for school meals um, based on their, their economic situation this year. And another uh, measure of success is making sure that our school leaders, our school nurses, our school social workers, our school counselors are engaging with those families so that they know that the meals are available to them. That was John Frasinelli from the Connecticut State Department of Education. I'm Marisol Castro. And I'm Chef Plum. Seasoned is produced by Robin Doyanakin and Katie Tolarski. Thanks for listening.